Yes, a couple. Come down the front as we sing our kids' time song. Here we go. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Building up the temple of the Lord. I think the boys have got it. Building up the temple, building up the temple, building up the temple of the Lord. Building up the temple of the Lord. All right, very good. Definitely the boys won. But the girls won last week, so that was fine. And Vera does it as well. That's good. All right. I'm very loud up here. Do I seem loud to the rest of you? Okay, all right. Bit too loud, says Rupert. Fair enough. All right. Each week here we read some of the special words of Jesus. What did Jesus say? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus tells us that God's kingdom is always closer to us, close enough. Our candle has gone out. Outrageous. This candle that reminds us of the hope of Jesus has gone out. Try that again. Very good. I was going to point to the candle and say the candle reminds us that God's kingdom is is within our grasp and also coming nearer as we count down the weeks to Christmas. And also, this is another thing that Paul says about Jesus. Let's say it together. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul, one of the leaders of the church, tells us the most important thing to do is think about Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. And although it's Easter to Christmas time, we also remember that the boy who was born in the stable became the man who died on the cross. And he is the Jesus who lives for us. So we're going to, in our lead up to Christmas, we're going to read some stories about Jesus as a little boy or about some of the Christmas events. And so this is one of the stories that happens just after Jesus is born about an old man named Simeon. Would you like to read? Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. Devout, yep. Devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. Okay, we'll come back and talk about the consolation in a minute. Someone over here to read? Oh. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Messiah. Okay, so this old man has been promised by God that he won't die until he sees the coming king, the new king. Someone else to read? Yep. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Okay. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying... Sovereign, sovereign, yep. sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may, <coughs> you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Okay. Sovereign is another word for king or royal or majesty. For my eyes I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of the all nations. Very good. A late for a light. A light for revelation. revelation to the generation. The Gentiles. Gentiles and the glory of your people is real. Okay, very good. I think that's it. So there's a picture of what this might have looked like. There was this really old man named Simeon. He was getting really, really old and old and old, but God had promised him, God had made him a promise that he wouldn't die until he saw the new king, the Messiah. And one day he heard God's voice saying to him, go into the temple today. Today is the day. And so this old man comes in, and as he comes in, he sees Mary and Joseph bringing in the baby Jesus. Um, they're just going to do what the law, their Jewish law requires for him, which we won't talk about with children. But he brought him in, and the old man Simeon sees the little baby and God, hears God's voice saying, this is the one. This is the new king. And so Simeon goes up to them and says, oh, can I hold your baby? And mums are always hesitant about that when strange old men come up and say, can I hold your baby? But Mary said, okay. She took the baby in his arms and he prayed this prayer to God, thanking God and saying, God, 
You can take me home now. I've seen the new king. He had amazing faith. He had an amazing hope that all the things that God had promised would come true. So in our passage, we talked about the consolation of Israel. That's a tricky bunch of words. Everybody say consolation. Consolation Consolation is when you give someone a nice hug or you give them something to make them feel better. The people had been promised that they were going to give, they were going to be given, God was going to give them a big hug. He was going to make things better for them by sending Jesus. And so that's the consolation of Israel. He'd been waiting for this for a long time, for God to keep his promises. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, salvation's a tricky word, but it really just means life. It means all the good things that God has for us. That's salvation, his life. He says, I've seen the good things you have for me. He's been looking forward for a long time with hope. And our candle's gone out again. Outrageous. What is going on? I'll light a different one. Let's see if that helps. Let's pretend that this one was lit the whole time. It's got a longer wick. So our candle there is burning this morning to remind us of hope. We have a hope. Hope means something is good is coming in the future, something we're looking forward to. And it's a hope that we talk about in our carol. We already sang this carol this morning, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Hey, do you want to sing it with me? No? All right. Who says yes? Who says no? Oh, you're outvoted. All right. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless streams, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. I want to talk about that word hope. The hopes of all the years. All these people had been waiting. They'd been waiting and waiting for centuries for Jesus to come. And all of a sudden, there he was. And so the carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. It's like all the scary things and all the happy things in all the world have come to the little town of Bethlehem. And because of that baby, everything's going to be different. So that's what this carol's all about. And it's good news for us because it says a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Who's a Gentile? Everybody should have their hands up. We're all Gentiles, all the different nations of the world. Whether you've got dark skin or light skin or brown skin or something in between, whether you're tall or short or fat like me or skinny like most of you, or whether you're really old or really young, or whether you speak English or Kenya Malenge or Tongan or Samoan or any other language, Auf Deutsch, whatever you speak, a bit of Japanese, that's fine. We're the Gentiles. And this is good news for us. Jesus has come to bring us as part of God's family no matter where we come from or what we look like. All right, I think that's enough preaching out of me. We're going to head out to Sunday school. Thank you for being part of our family. And remember, when you see the candles, this week the candle is reminding us of the hope we have in Jesus. Off you go. Let's keep on singing. I'll hand over to our worship team. Jumbo, thank you very much. That's how we say hello in Swahili. Everybody say jumbo. Jumbo. All right. Very good. Um, I'm having fun in my suit. I don't know whether to clap on one and three or two and four. That's a very old joke. All right. Very good. Wasn't it lovely last week to see all our children up on the stage leading us in worship and singing and doing all the things we did there? We have children of all the nations. And it was a wonderful experience. So if you missed last week, I encourage you to watch the video and see all the things that have happened there. I normally say if you've come in with sermon notes, there won't be any sermon notes during Advent um, because of general chaos and disorder in my house. Um, Yes, that's all I'll say about that. We are a people of, of many nations. There are people here who are born in Australia whose people have been here for hundreds or thousands or forever years and other people who are brand new to our country. Some of you speak English as your natural language, some as your second language, some as your third or fourth language. And I need to remember that because sometimes I use words that not everyone knows. Do you know what an optimist is? 
An optimist is someone who always sees the best in everything. No matter what happens, they say, this is the best thing that could have happened because. And a pessimist is the opposite. They see every situation. They see the worst in every situation. There's a story of two small boys, brothers. One was an optimist and one was a pessimist. In fact, one was so optimistic that he was impossible to get down and one was so down in the dumps he was impossible to raise up. And so the, the dad decided one day he would teach these boys the importance of balance. He said, what I'll do is I'll get two rooms, and one room I will fill with all the best toys a boy could ever possibly want, and I'll put the pessimist in there. And the other room, I'll go down to the local stables, and I'll get a whole bunch of horse manure, and I'll put it in that room, and I'll put the optimist in there to tell him that things, you know, things aren't always going to be good. Well, he did this. He made the arrangements. He put the boys in the two separate rooms. He came back a few minutes later, and the pessimistic boy was in a room full of all the toys, and he's sitting there crying. And the father says, why are you crying? He says, oh, Dad, I just know that someone's going to come and take all these wonderful toys away, and I'll never be happy again. Father dismisses that and goes to the next room, and in the next room is his other boy sitting in a pile of horse manure, laughing his head off and throwing it over his head like this. And the father goes, what are you doing? He says, oh, Dad, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. There's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Today is the first day of Advent, and here's when we talk about hope but not the hope that there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. Advent is, um, maybe some of you haven't given much thought to Advent. Here's our little crash course. Advent has been around for a long time. The earliest written records of the season of Advent date back to the year 380. So we've been talking about this for a long time. But we know the church likely celebrated, celebrated Advent in some form even before then. So many of our Christmas traditions go back so far, whether it's lighting Christmas candles or the carols we sing. One of my favorite carols, and Letitia, I think it's yours as well, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, is an Advent song that Christians have been singing since about the 700s, that same song. Come, O Come, Emmanuel, our rescue ransomed Israel. That song we have been singing for 1,300 years, that same tune. So what is Advent anyway? Well, it's the four weeks, the four Sundays before Christmas, and the word comes from the Latin Adventus, which means coming or arrival. It's when we celebrate Christ's death and, oh, sorry, Easter is when we celebrate uh, Christ's death and resurrection, so the season of Advent prepares us to celebrate the coming of Christ, his arrival in our world. And Advent also reminds us to wait with eager expectation for Jesus' second coming. So in the time of Advent, we're not just counting down the days to Christmas, we're reminding ourselves of the reality that Jesus is coming back. And the truth is that the whole church, whatever your denomination, whatever your background, wherever you're from in the world, Whatever your tradition, we are joined together with our anticipation of Jesus' arrival. The Holy Spirit unites millions of us across countries, languages, denominations, even across the centuries through the great cloud of witnesses. Our hearts need Advent because we need light in the darkness. The beautiful tradition of Advent candles reminds us of the themes of hope, peace, joy, and love. But most of all, they remind us that Jesus is the light that illuminates the world. Take heart. We are not alone. Jesus has come, and Jesus is coming again. May that light carry you through the darkness. And this week we focus on hope. Not the optimism of there's got to be a pony in here somewhere, but hope, confidence, certainty, taking Jesus at his word, looking forward to the things he has promised. What is our 
hope. The Old Testament people had hope in the coming of their Messiah. For thousands of years, the Hebrew children waited for what had been promised to them through the prophets. From the earliest pages of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, the promise, God makes the promise that someone is coming to stamp on the head of the serpent. From the promise made to Abraham that through his descendants, all the peoples of the world would be blessed. From the law of Moses, the promise that God would raise up a great prophet who would speak the very words of God. From the covenant with King David, where God promised that one of David's descendants would rule forever and ever. There are repeated promises in the Old Testament. And one of the most famous is in Isaiah chapter 2, where God says that a day is coming of universal peace when swords will be beaten into plows and spears into pruning hooks. And another promise in Jeremiah, where God promises that a day is coming when his laws will be written on the hearts of people. There'll no longer be any need to teach a neighbor or a child about God. They will just know him and they will know his ways. Well, the Hebrew people waited patiently and sometimes not so patiently, for centuries. And in our reading from Luke today, we heard the story of that old man, one of those people, Simeon, that man who has waited and waited through all his long life and at last sees the infant Jesus and knows in his heart that God has kept his promise and now he can depart this life in peace. And so here at the beginning of the Gospels, Jesus fulfills almost all the promises of the Old Testament about the Messiah in the story of his birth and how he lived. And we celebrate at Christmas time the fulfillment of these prophecies in Jesus. But there are still some yet to be fulfilled. We still have war. We still have violence. We still have chaos in the world. Not all the swords have been beaten into plows. And the lions and the lambs, They're not getting on so well. And Advent is not just about celebrating the fulfillment of past hopes. We're also remembering the future promises that Jesus has made to us. We look forward with expectation to the completion, the fulfillment, the culmination of the kingdom of God. As we read almost every week here, from Mark 1 verse 15, will you read it with me? The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus promises that the kingdom of God is within our grasp and is coming closer and is coming more and more each and every day. So what are we hoping for? What are we expecting As part of my, um, my job, I, as part of my work, I, I go and teach scripture in the schools. And I've been at Logan Reserve, it's over that way, I've been at Logan Reserve School for the last six months or so teaching the children. And I always give them a little piece of paper at the start of term and get them to write out any question they have about God, about the Bible, about anything. Um, and I'll try and answer that question. I pull them out randomly and try and answer the children's question. And you would be surprised how often the children ask a question like this. How will the world come to an end? Or when will the world come to an end? And I say to the children, well, first of all, it's not going to. We'll come back to that in a minute. And no one knows when. I say it's not going to because the Bible doesn't speak about the world coming to an end. The Bible speaks about a remaking a recreation, a renovation, if you like, of this world. And then for history to keep on going, but this time with Jesus on the throne and everything set right. Everything put right, and then things keep going. What was it that Simeon was hoping for? He was hoping for salvation. He was hoping to see the promise of God. Salvation means life, life in Jesus. What are you hoping for? 
What difference does Jesus make in your life? If we were to take a poll of people and say, what is it that Christians are looking forward to? Most people would say something like, I'm waiting for my soul to go to heaven when I die. And that's fair enough. That is a hope. My soul can go to heaven when I die. This is the common idea of what Christians are hoping for. And there are probably about three verses in the New Testament that suggest that that's what's going to happen. That when you die, the next thing you know, you wake up in the presence of Jesus and your conscience in in death, floating around in the clouds with Jesus. Probably three verses in the New Testament that suggest that. And even they are not definitive. For instance, Paul said it's better to go and be with Christ than to put up with all you lot. He doesn't quite put it like that. But when he's being challenged, he says, look, all I want to do is go and be with Jesus. I'm sick of you people and I want to go home. Actually, he's sick of the Romans beating him up, but he wants to go and be with Jesus. Or in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, I want to, uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he talks about the glory that God has in store for those who trust him. And we can't imagine what that's going to be like or what it would be like to wake up in that new world. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that he longs to be clothed instead with his heavenly dwelling. He wants to take off this old body, he says, and wake up with Jesus. The reality of the hope, the hope of the New Testament is not that we go to heaven and float around as spirits or souls. You know, floating around in the heavens and strumming a harp with a halo on our head. That's not a biblical idea. That comes more from a guy called Plato than it does from the Bible. Plato was a Greek philosopher who lived a couple of hundred years before Jesus, and a lot of his writing influenced the early Christians, even though Plato was not a Christian at all. And we've inherited so much of his ideas that sometimes we think this is what the Bible means. But it's not at all. I could probably go for an hour about that, but I'm not going to. Plato had this idea that the spirit is good and the flesh not so good. In fact, some of Plato's followers later on changed his ideas to say that actually that everything physical is actually evil and only things that are spiritual are good. The soul is good, Plato says, but it's trapped, it's imprisoned in this physical being. And so we have this platonic model of salvation, this idea that we're going to be saved from matter, saved from the physical things, saved from our bodies. But this isn't what the Bible says at all. God is intimately involved with stuff, with us, with matter. God seems fascinated with making stuff. If you look at how many different kinds of beetles there are in the world, you'd think that God is obsessed with beetles because there are more species of beetles than any other kind of creature on the planet. He seems to spend delight in this one's got to have this kind of thing and that kind of thing. And Go and look at how many beetles there are. Get on the internet. You'll never come to an end of it. Google beetles and not those beetles with the long hair. I could be a beetle in my suit. Hey, do I look like a beetle suit? Paul, do you like my suit? You happy? Very good. All right. I could be a beetle if I grew my hair longer. What was I talking about? Beetles. I wasn't talking about beetles. That's not even on the page. If the ultimate goal is for us to die so we can escape the material world and go to heaven, then why did God bother with making all this stuff? If he just wants us to float around in the clouds, why did he make dirt? If, if, it's, if, if the point of life is to die so we can float around in the heavens, then the world is just a transitional place. The world is just like a bus station where we sit and wait until we get to go to where we actually want to go. Or worse, it's like a petrol station bathroom, a place to be used but not cared for. The world is like rearranging the furniture on the Titanic. It's all going to sink anyway, so why bother moving the deck chairs? Back in the 80s, there was a, 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 an environment secretary, I think it was President Reagan or President Bush, one of those guys, appointed a, a born-again Christian as his environmental secretary. And he got in trouble because he kept giving permission for people to chop down all the trees. And they said to him, why, why are you chopping down all these trees? He said, well, Jesus will come back soon. We don't need all the trees. He didn't last very long as environment secretary. They got rid of him. But if your attitude is that this world is only temporary and it's all going to be destroyed anyway 
then why do we bother to build stuff? Why bother looking after koalas? They're all going to burn up when the world's destroyed anyway. If that's your view of salvation, then you will have limited interest in the things of this world. You'll focus on saving these souls, whatever they are, getting people to sign on the bottom line, to say the sinner's prayer. My brother used to say in the Salvation Army that as soon as someone came to the penitent form and gave their heart to Jesus and confessed their sins, we should hit them over the head with a brick and send them straight to Jesus. I'm not sure we'd get many converts if we did that. But if that's the goal, the goal is just get them to say the sinner's prayer so they can go to heaven, then let's just cut out the middleman and kill them on the spot. I think we would have trouble convincing people of that. If that's your view of salvation, then you're waiting for a pie in the sky when you die. By and by. That's not what the Bible says. In contrast, the New Testament hope is not of salvation from the physical world, but rather is the salvation of the physical world, of the physical body, of physical history. The world is not going to come to an end. It's going to come to an end as we know it, and then Jesus is going to keep it going with him in charge, the way things were always meant to be. The gospel involves all of creation because God loves stuff. He loves matter. He loves the things he has made. Matter is not bad. It's good. And we can see that from the very first pages of creation story. God said, let there be light. And then he said, it's good. And then he made all the different things he made. He made the land and the sea. And he said it was good. He made the sun and the moon. He said it's good. Oh, he made the stars also. That throwaway line. He made the stars as well. Billions and billions and billions upon billions of universes, of galaxies, sorry. And the Bible says, he made the stars. And he said it was good. And all the things that God makes, he looks at and says, it is good. And then he made you and me. He made humanity and said, it's very good. It's very good. In fact, God loves matter so much that God became matter. He became stuff. He became flesh. We have that fancy word, the incarnation. The idea that God takes on meat and becomes like us. It can't be all that bad, this matter, if it's compatible with the very presence of God. You know, Plato had some things right. There is something wrong with our world. Matter is defective. It is flawed. We are infected with sin. Our matter is corrupt. And ever since Adam and Eve did the wrong thing in the Garden of Eden, things go wrong and fall apart and people get old and die. But that's not how it was meant to be. God loves matter. And God plans to redeem the whole thing. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes again that the whole of creation is groaning as if in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation is suffering under the weight of sin and the choices that people have made through the centuries. But God is going to redeem the whole of creation. In Colossians chapter 1, again, he says, God was pleased through Jesus to have all of his fullness of God dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. How many things? A few things? Lots of things? Many things? No, how many things? All things, including all the Beatles. To reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. God is in the business of saving the whole world. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read that God... He's made to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under all of it under Christ. Closing chapters of the book of Revelation speak of this reality. 
We read all through Revelation. It's a book of metaphor. It's a book of, of pictures, language. It's a book of some scary stuff. And in the end, there's a talk of a new earth. But the new earth doesn't wipe out the old earth. The new earth is the old earth rebuilt, redone, renovated, put right. I have never seen the Grand Canyon. And at this point, I don't think I'm going to bother going. But in the new world, I think the Grand Canyon is still going to be there. And I'm going to go and see it. People saw the, the Great Barrier Reef when it was in its prime. By the time I get there, I don't think there'll be much left. But in the new world, it'll be just the way it was meant to be. It'll be put right. The world is cleaned up and made right. And the good news is not that we get to leave earth and go to heaven. The good news is that we get to bring heaven down here to earth. And this is the trajectory of Emmanuel. Of Emmanuel. We sang that this morning in our first carol. Emmanuel is a Greek word that simply means God is with us. And when we pray, as we prayed this morning, the, the, the prayer Jesus taught us, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the body of Christ. And so we're meant to do what Jesus did. We bring a slice of heaven into people's lives. Jesus paid attention to people's physical bodies. Not once did Jesus say to someone, and how is your soul? But he did say to them, do you want to see? Would you like to walk? How can I help you today? Jesus never said to somebody, where would you be if you died tonight? That's a good question. It's just not a question that Jesus asked. Jesus was intimately concerned with the physical well-being of his listeners. Salvation has a physical component manifesting here and now what will be true in its fullness in the future, bringing the not yet into the now. And so we push back against the corruption. We push back against sin. We push back against the things in the world that are not the way God wants them to be. If we're convinced that God's going to destroy the whole world by fire, then God, bring the fire and do it and let's get it over and done with. But he's not in that business. He's in the business of remaking the world, and we have a part to play in that. We push back against those things that are wrong, whether through people who are physically unwell, through medicine, through living healthy lives, through praying for people, through expecting miracles of healing. We push back against sin and death. We push back against homelessness because everyone will have a home in the new world. We push back against sickness. We push back against poverty. We push back against immorality. Because we want this world to be the way God wants it to be. We work against those things here and now because we want things to be right. We try to see the future now. We want to be light to the world, as Jesus said we would be. Jesus cared about the physical well-being of the people he worked with, and so should we. I'll finish with a few verses from Revelation chapter 21. The end of the Bible the end of the story, looking forward to that future day. And John the Revelator says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Take note of what is happening here. People aren't being sucked up into heaven to float on the clouds. No, heaven is coming down to earth. The new Jerusalem comes down to the new rebuilt, renovated earth. And God comes and lives amongst us here. And then a few verses on. John writes, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, that is Jesus, are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, 
and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Revelation ends with this beautiful picture of all the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, you and me, bringing everything that is good and best about our culture, our language, our way, and bringing it all into the new Jerusalem. We are a part of this story. Jesus did not look like me. He was not pale like me. Do you know I'm the darkest? I, at my primary school, I'm the blackest kid who went to my primary school. They used to call me Wog Boy. That was my nickname in Boona. Uh, it's hard to believe, but that's how white the town was. We were German or we were English and we knew who was who. And I was the brownest one of them all. I don't know how. We had an Aboriginal boy come when I was in grade four and an Indian boy in grade six, and his nickname was Chong because he was Asian and we didn't know any better. Anyway, what I'm trying to say to you is, as I look out on this congregation and I see the brown faces and the black faces and the pale faces and every, fa every color face in between, we are a glimpse of that future day that Revelation speaks about and the glory and honor of the nations. All that we have that is good and best will be brought into the kingdom of God. God isn't about burning the world down. He isn't about destroying your culture, your language. He wants to redeem it. He wants to restore it. He wants to make it right. And we have a part to play in all that. Are there any questions this morning before we conclude? Yes. Oh, good. Straight out the gate. I didn't even get a chance to explain that. I'd like to stop and see if there are any questions. Letitia, go. Oh, that's a big question. Thank you, Letitia. That's a good question. Okay, so Letitia's asking about what happens to the people who don't want to live in that place. Um, who don't want to live with Jesus? What is happening to them? Eternal destiny. That's the, probably a big question. That's probably the biggest question. What happens to people who don't believe when they die? Good question, Letitia. Um, as a Wesleyan Methodist, we have, a, we have our doctrinal position, and that's what I say from up here, and I'm not going to say anything different. If you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I can. The position of the Wesleyan Methodist Church is that everybody has a choice. Everyone in this life gets a choice of how they will live. Jesus is the judge, and he will then make decisions. There will be eternal consequences. I am not a universalist. I am not saying that Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot and King Leopold of the Belgians will be in heaven. I don't know what their eternal state will be. I don't believe that everyone will be saved, and the Bible makes that very clear. There is a place of eternal destruction. We could have a conversation about what that place of eternal destruction is like, but I'm not doing that this morning. But there is a place where the world in its renovation, all the stuff that is not compatible with the goodness of God, will not be there. So no more mosquitoes. Or at least maybe we're all praying that that would be the case. Or at least the mosquitoes won't bite us. I don't know how that's going to work. But everything that is not compatible with the goodness of God will not be in that new creation. And for human beings and angelic beings who reject the goodness of God and reject his path of salvation there is some kind of alternative destructive outcome. Does that answer your question? You're thinking, I'm, you're thinking I'm too much like a universalist. You're worried that I'm saying everyone's going to be saved. Any other questions this morning? Yes, Hans. Language. The language. Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know is the short answer to that. Hans is asking, what about languages? Will we all be speaking the same language in heaven? Did I say we would all bring our languages? I think we'll bring the best parts of our language. I don't know. Maybe as we bring all our languages together, it'll form back into one glorious whole with 137 different cases and all the rest of it. We borrow good words from each other. The best word we've borrowed from the Germans? Schadenfreude. Taking joy in the pain of others. Thank you for that, Germany. But all of it, and the best word we borrowed from the Italians, pizza. 
all the different words we have. Maybe on that glorious whole we'll all be talking, who knows, language changes over centuries, yes. Perhaps we will. Who knows? Perhaps we'll all understand what everyone's saying, or perhaps we'll have eternity to learn. As the Klingons say, you haven't read Shakespeare until you've heard it in the original Klingon. Any other questions? You put your hand up, Ben? No, you're just waving at me. Very good. All right. My question this morning is, what is your hope in? I don't want to discourage you or tell you that everything you learnt in Sunday school or your mother's knee was wrong. I'm not looking forward to floating on a cloud with a harp of gold and a halo on my head like we see in the cartoons. You know, whenever Bugs Bunny gets shot and ends up in heaven, he's always floating around with a harp. That's not what heaven's going to be like. It's going to be a physical place. It's going to be here on, on earth. God is going to come and live with us, not the other way around. So I just want you to think about what your hope is. What are you hoping for? I'm hoping to see the Grand Canyon as it was meant to be. I'm hoping to visit the Great Barrier Reef as it was designed to be. I'm hoping to travel to all the wonderful places through the world, meeting all those glorious people and hearing their stories. I'm hoping <laughs> to one day sit with my grandma again. And I'll stop there before I burst into tears. We can all think of what we're hoping for in that day. Let's have a biblical hope, not a platonic hope. The song I've chosen for our reflection time this morning reminds us to look beyond this world to the world beyond, but also to put our faith in God. He is the one. So this song is based on, on the Psalms. To the hills I lift my eyes, the distant hills before me. And although it's talking about hills, it's talking about God and that hope that's just over the horizon will come to us. Perhaps this morning as we sing, you would like to reflect. If the Lord is speaking to you, here's an opportunity to come forward for prayer. To the hills I lift my eyes, the distant hills before me. Hills that rise to reach the skies and spread their glory o'er me. Planted by omnipotent hand, by divine appointment they stand. To the hills I lift my eyes, the beckoning hills before me. Eyes may scan the dizzy height, and human feet stand on it. Only faith in mystic flight can see the realms beyond it. Steeper than the mountains of time, Higher than the loftiest climb, o'er the hills I lift my eyes, from thence my help is coming. To the hills I'll turn again, away from earthly slumber. There to gain the topmost plain, may not my way encumber. On the highest summit I'll stand, there to view the long-promised land. Though my eyes look to the skies, I lift my heart to heaven. Let's pray. Father God, this morning I pray that you would give us a fresh hope, a fresh sight of what it is that Jesus has promised to us. Father God, help us to look forward to his coming, to his putting things right, to his putting an end to the corruption and sin in this world once and for all. Father God, 
Help us to live in expectation of that hope and to do our part as we look forward to that. Father God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't have that hope in their heart, who doesn't know you, who doesn't know the joy of sins forgiven and the promise of life eternal, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would come by your Holy Spirit and speak to that person just now. That you would light a fire in their soul that cannot be put out and bring them to a place of repentance and faith. We pray all this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I invite the worship group to come. Was that song new to many of you? Hardly any of you joined in with me. Was that a, that must be a Salvation Army one. Did the Salvos know it? Not even the Salvos know it. Well, there you go. It's a good song. I think it's Irish. So those of us from the Irish who've got Irish blood in us, you would have felt your heart skip a joy there. All right. We want people to meet Jesus. And so we want to grow to be like Jesus. We want to share Jesus' message. We want to love the way Jesus loves. So I pray this week that you would be encouraged and that you would help people to meet Jesus. Thank you. God bless you.